you would please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We do have uh, handouts uh, on the back table there, just inside the hallway there. If you didn't get one of those and would like to have one, uh, you can feel free to do that. Very special welcome to our guests today. If you're among that number, thank you for coming our way today. Let's begin our class by going to God in prayer, then we'll study together. Gracious Father in heaven, we're thankful for every blessing that we receive from your generous hand. We come before you this morning to praise you, to worship you. We pray, Father, that you would receive all of the honor and the glory that is due to you. We pray for your blessing today as we study from 1 Timothy, and we pray that the other classes that are meeting at this hour would be blessed as well. We pray that we would honor you Glorify you in everything we say and do. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Last uh, Sunday, of course, we were finishing up our weekend workshop called Transformed. And so we took a break from this particular study. So it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in First Timothy but we finished chapter 1, and uh, toward the end, or at the end of chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul had written to Timothy that he was uh, entrusting Timothy with uh, a certain command that was in harmony with prophecies that had been given regarding Timothy. Now, we don't know what specifically those prophecies were, but uh, he said, does Paul, that um, that it would be by those prophecies that Timothy would be able to fight the good fight or wage the good warfare. And, uh, and so the, the command that Paul was entrusting to Timothy, I believe goes back to the first part of chapter 1, where he, uh, he writes to Timothy to instruct, into verse 3, certain ones not to teach strange doctrines and pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, and so forth. Verse 5, the goal of that instruction, and that word instruction means command, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And so then at the end of that chapter, he says, I'm committing that to you, Timothy, in harmony with these prophecies. So not only was Paul saying to Timothy, I'm trusting you with this uh, responsibility, but since it's in harmony with prophecies revealed about you, Paul is also telling Timothy, this, God is also entrusting this to you. God believes you can handle this trust just as I do. And so wage the good warfare. Uh, do it, verse 19, keeping faith and a good conscience. Uh, it's, it's a battle, yes. It's a war, yes. But it's a battle that must be fought fairly uh, with faith and a good conscience, a good sense of moral sensitivity. Uh, though some have rejected that, Timothy was not to reject that. And so wage the good warfare. Now, when we come into chapter 2, Paul's going to start giving some of the specifics uh, for Timothy that fall under that broad responsibility of fighting the good fight or waging the good warfare. And so here's what he says. We're going to look today at verses 1 through 7. That's the plan anyway. First of all then... I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. 
For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. All right. So wage the good warfare, end of chapter 1. Now he gets into the specifics and he says, first of all. In other words, here's, here's what I want you to do first in the process of waging this warfare. And the first thing that he wants Timothy to do is to pray. Now, the specifics of his prayer are also outlined, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But I want for us to think, first of all, just about that concept. And the concept of it in connection with the context of this book. Obviously, all Christians are to be people of prayer. Pray without ceasing, right? 1 Thessalonians 5 uh, and other passages. Right, If we're going to follow the example of Jesus, for example, we'll be people of prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer. So all of that's true. Specifically, in this context, remember, Paul is writing to Timothy, who was a preacher of the gospel. And one of the things that is a part of preaching should be prayer. That preachers are not exempt from that. And in some ways, uh, need to be in prayer about things that perhaps other people are not automatically involved in with regard to prayer. You know, preachers' sermon preparation, uh, preparing for the delivery of sermons, all of that should be saturated in prayer. Uh, When the apostles in Acts chapter 6 were confronted with Uh, a problem that existed in the church at Jerusalem, and it had to do with how certain widows were being treated by the church. And they had these widows, they were were Grecian widows, which means they they were Jewish people, Jewish widows, but they they had been raised in a a Greek culture and had embraced a lot of, of uh, of that culture. And a lot of times... Jewish people who had embraced the Greek culture, they had Hellenized is is the term, that a lot of the Jewish people who had rejected that would look upon those who had accepted more of the culture as being not as faithful as they should have been, and so sometimes they were shunned a little bit. Well, that seems to have been happening in the early church. And so these Grecian widows, these Hellenistic uh, widows, had brought uh, concerns to the apostles about that. Well, in the context of the apostles dealing with that, they said, all right, you know, select seven individuals, seven men from among you that meet these qualifications, and let's turn this matter over to them so that they can handle it. And they, they said that it was more important for them, the apostles, because their primary responsibility was in teaching, that they not be taken away from that responsibility to deal with this responsibility. Not that it was a lesser responsibility, it was just a different one. And there were other people, other good qualified people that could handle that, that that would allow for the apostles not to be taken away from their primary ministry and work. And that primary primary ministry was stated in Acts 6 verse 4 as two major responsibilities, prayer and the ministry of the word. We often talk about and emphasize the ministry of the Word as it pertains to those who preach, and that's good and that's right. But it's interesting that he says, this is our primary responsibility, prayer and the ministry of the Word. Paul seems to be emphasizing that, at least to some degree, to Timothy here when he says, I want you to wage the good warfare. I want you to fight the good fight. Now let me tell you what specifically is involved in that. First of all, Timothy, pray. He's going to get to some of these other responsibilities too, but that's where he starts. Pray, I urge you, verse 1. The idea of beg, plead, literally the word means to call someone to your side. And the picture is calling someone to your side, kind of putting your arm around them and and saying, I'm I'm urging you, I'm, I'm pleading with you to do this. Here's what he pleads for. Here's what he urges. Prayer, but he he urges prayer in using four different terms. There's some nuance 
to these words, these different words, nuance of meaning. Uh, you know, if there weren't, then he would have just said, I urge you to pray, 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 and pray. <laughs> all right, but he doesn't do that. He uses four different words, but they all have to do with prayer. Entreaties, the first word that he uses is, is a word that's, that, that highlights urgent request, an urgency of request. Prayers is the general word uh, for prayer, the general word for personally addressing deity. Petitions is a word referring mainly to intercessory prayer, praying on behalf of other people. And then thanksgivings, of course, is, is basically self-defining, the giving of thanks, the offering of gratitude. Now he says, this is what I urge. I want these things to be made for all men. But then specifically, beginning in verse 2, his primary focus, at least here, is for people who are in positions of authority. For kings, which of course would be the, the highest ranking authority, but not just for kings, for anybody and everybody that's in a position of authority. And obviously, contextually, he's talking about those in civil authority. From, from the lowest figures, as far as authority is concerned, to the highest. Whoever's in a position, because of, of their authority, to affect life, to affect life in, 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 a, in a civil context, pray for those people. But he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just say pray for them generically. Wouldn't be anything wrong with that, of course. But he has a specific purpose and a specific request in mind. Look at it in verse 2. For kings and all who are in authority, so that... Maybe your translation doesn't have the word so, but maybe it has that. Okay, Pray that... Right? And so the, the, the so that or the that is an introduction to a purpose statement. And as you're reading through the Bible, not just First Timothy, anywhere, sometimes it's, it's important regularly to try to keep maybe in your mind some remember to look for certain words that, that, that call attention to specific things. Therefore is one of those words. When you're reading through the scriptures and you come across the word therefore, that, that, that's a good, um, it's a good thing to try to train your mind to recognize therefore and stop when you come across it and recognize, okay, the writer is about to draw a conclusion based upon what I'm reading here. So this, this is kind of an important statement he's about to make, therefore. One of the other words that's important to note like that is the so that, or the that, because, again, the writer is, is about to make a purpose statement. In other words, I'm giving you this instruction for this purpose, to accomplish this result. So anytime you come across a that or a so that, stop and highlight that in your mind and really focus on what he's instructing because it's going to involve the reason. Either here's why I'm telling you to do this, or here's the goal or the result that I hope to accomplish through this instruction. All right, so pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So Timothy, I want you to pray. But I don't want you just to pray, as important as general prayer is. I want you to pray for kings. But Timothy, I don't just want you to pray for kings. I want you to pray for all that are in positions of authority. But I don't just want you to pray, and I don't just want you to pray for kings and people that are in authority, but I want you to pray for them for a specific purpose. I want you to pray for all of these people so that we can live a tranquil, that word means undisturbed, an undisturbed and quiet life in all godliness. Respect for God, respect for God's law, and dignity. The word means seriousness, proper conduct. So when you put that together, Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to pray 
that leaders, civil leaders, from kings to whoever, whoever may be in a position of influence, pray for them so that they will govern and, and lead in a way that allows us to live godly lives, to live lives that show proper honor and respect for God and for His will, that we can live lives of proper conduct and seriousness and gravity, but that we can live those godly and serious lives undisturbed, in peace, in tranquility. All right? Timothy, you're going to be involved in a war. You are involved in a war. And based on prophecies delivered about you and my confidence in you, I'm entrusting you with that instruction. You wage that good warfare. If you want to do that, and you want to be able to do it effectively, then the first thing I'm telling you to do is you pray for the people that have an effect on the culture and society in which you live. And pray that they will lead in a way that allows you to live that life, to wage that warfare, to be involved in godly living, and to be able to do that in peace and in quietness. All right? So it really, it's a, it's a prayer that goes beyond just the general request of God, please, please bless our leaders. Anything wrong with that? You know, please bless our, you know, our president and our Congress and our Supreme Court and all that. Fine. I'm not saying it's wrong to just pray generically like that. But specifically, Paul says here, here's the purpose for praying for those leaders that they will lead in a way that allows Christianity to prosper. That's, that's ultimately, in a nutshell, what he's asking them to pray for. That we can be godly, that we can lead lives of godliness in peace and in tranquility without having our lives, our Christianity, impeded by those people who are in positions of authority. Now here's a side point to that. But I think an important one. To petition God in that way, to spend time in prayer, praying for those people, to rule in that way, implies, doesn't it, that God is still active in the kingdoms of men? You know, that was a point that, um, that is made several times in the book of Daniel. We're studying Daniel on Wednesday nights in the class I teach in the back. And that's one of the things that we have emphasized throughout that study is that the book of Daniel is not so much a book about Daniel as it is a book about God. Because from start to finish, the thing that is emphasized to Daniel and by Daniel is God is sovereign. You may find yourself in a position where you are influenced by civil rulers, as Daniel was, taken from his homeland, taken to Babylon, working in the palace under a, a, a very powerful king. Um, but the point that keeps being emphasized throughout that book is, regardless of who may be in power in a civil way, God is ultimately sovereign. Daniel 2, when he uh, interpreted uh, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, that was one of the points. It was that, uh, that the dream was designed to teach Nebuchadnezzar that there is a God in Israel who has the ability to direct the rising and falling of nations, which is what Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2 was about that Daniel interpreted. Later, chapter 3, the, uh, the three friends. The ultimate issue in that whole event with the fiery furnace and all that, is who's sovereign? Is it this ruler that says, you bow down to me or die, or God? And the answer is, well, God is sovereign. And the three friends make that point. They say, you know what, we don't know what God's going to do. God may choose to save us, he may not. Bottom line is, we're going to serve him, because he's God, because he's sovereign and you're not. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled he has uh, another dream. Daniel interprets it. 
and says, here's the point. At some point, you're going to grow a little bit too arrogant. And God's going to humble you to remind you that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomsoever he will. Daniel 4.25. Happens just like Daniel said it would. Nebuchadnezzar becomes arrogant. He said, look at all this kingdom that I myself have created and built for myself. God says, not so fast. He's humbled to prove that God rules in the kingdoms of men. The prophecies about the rising and falling of nations that you have in the book of Daniel is all to make the point, God is in control of this. God is sovereign. So the book of Daniel is a book about God. Now, when Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, pray for civil authorities so that Christians can live in a way that allows them to live in peace. That implies that God has the ability to make that happen. Therefore, it's not just lip service to that. It's not just lip service to, to pray those words. We're praying those words to a God who has the ability to, to answer those prayers in a positive way, to guide and direct in His providence, in His sovereignty, to guide and direct the direction of nations for the benefit of His people. That, that Christianity can flourish. Now, I'm not going to be one who stands up and says, I know exactly how God is going to work that out and which nations he's going to allow to flourish in that way, and which ones have gotten too arrogant for themselves and are going to have to be brought low like Nebuchadnezzar was. I, I, I don't have that information, and God's not going to open up the heavens and reveal that to us. But he's revealed enough for us to know that he has the ability, and in harmony with his will, will answer those prayers in harmony with his will to direct the course of nations to the advantage of his people. Which ought to put us on our knees more, shouldn't it? If we really believe that. So that's where Paul starts. Yes. About the prayer, uh, when we pray and God is active in the world, mm -hmm. Mm. manner, such as my father died. Uh, please bring my father back for you. That'd be supernatural. Right. But <clears throat> to direct the relationship between powers, mm. I mean, that could be done. And I'm afraid that there's a lot of people that think that whatever I pray for, God can do it. Well, God can do it. Sure. <clears throat> Mm. means and, and there's people that are being fooled and tricked by that. Right. Yeah, and that's a good point. And that's why we need to be careful that, that we couch our language, uh, as, as I hope I did a few minutes ago, that God will respond to those prayers in harmony with His will. And, and that we don't always know what His will is, um, and that there are certain principles that also come to bear on our prayers that will have an effect on the answer that we receive from them. James chapter 2, you mentioned asking amiss, the language of James chapter 4, actually James 4, verses 1 and 2, where James said, uh, you ask but do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own lusts. James' point there is, you're asking... You're praying, you're making requests, but the reason why you're not receiving the answer to your prayers is because your motivation is faulty. In other words, you're not praying and making requests out of an ultimate desire for God's will to be done, but your prayers are motivated more by your own selfishness. And God's not obligated to grant us anything that we want just because we're selfish. All right? So... When we ask, 1 John 5, verse 14, if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us and will grant the request. Now what that means is, 
God's, it doesn't mean that God's going to give you anything you ask for as long as you mouth the words, your will be done. Okay? It's not a magical formula that as long as you say those words in the prayer, then you're guaranteed to get whatever it is you ask. No, he's saying if what you're asking for is in harmony with God's will for you, then you will get it. But you may ask for something that is not in harmony with God's will. And if it's not in harmony with His will, He's not going to grant it. Because God knows better for you what you need than you do, and than I do. Right? So it becomes, prayer becomes not so much our, not so much the desire for our wills to be done in heaven, but for God's will to be done on earth. Now, do we make requests? Sure, God said do that. Let your requests be made known to God, Philippians 4. But we make those requests always with the recognition that, yes, from my perspective, this is what I believe I need. Yet I know, God, that you know more than I do. And so I ultimately commit my request to your will, and may your will be done, and may I be strengthened to be able to accept your will, especially when I don't understand it. That's, that's faith. That's confidence and trust. Yes? What does it say when you see that prayer for, you know, the civil authority and the people who have been killed? Because it brings tranquility to the thought. Mm. Which is chaos, like you mentioned. Yes. And I thought, well, myself, uh, who may have access to all the court and all the light? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, that that prayer not only brings God into the equation for Him to be active, but just the process of our expressing that idea to God and turning that over to God brings, brings some peace and tranquility to our own hearts personally when we force ourselves, maybe for lack of better terminology, to say, you know what, I'm going to put this in His hands. And in whose hands would it better be put <laughs> than His? Prayer by its very nature is what someone has called the language of dependence. Just by the simple fact that we take time to pray and, and, re, and make requests of God and all of that is in itself an admission that we have at least some level of dependence on somebody besides ourselves. Right? And that promotes the kind of humility that we need to, uh, to listen to God as He expresses Himself in His Word. All right? So good, very good. So Paul begins that way and says, Okay, Timothy, here's where you start. I want you to pray. I want you to pray for rulers. Pray that they will lead in a way that brings peace and tranquility for, for Christians that we can live lives of godliness. Now, verse 3. That was the focus of the prayer, verses 1 and 2. Now, beginning in 3, the reason for it. This is good, verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This meaning what he just instructed Timothy to do. Pray for rulers. Pray for an environment of peace and tranquility for Christianity. This, doing that, is pleasing to God, acceptable to God, because, verse 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Timothy, you're a preacher, right? Right. Your primary responsibility is to try to reach people with the good news of Jesus, right? Right. Timothy, don't you want to have the best possible environment for that to be able to happen? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, then pray about that. Pray that God would create an environment enough of an environment of peace and tranquility so that you can accomplish the work that you've been entrusted with. And not only that, God wants all people to be saved 
and to come to an understanding of the truth. So praying for that peaceful environment is good and acceptable in, and right in the sight of God because God wants all people to be saved. And so God wants for there to be an environment peaceful enough for Christianity to prosper. So, Timothy, that's why I'm telling you to pray about that. Now, just a few things particularly about his wording here. First of all, God desires for all men to be saved. And that word for men is the generic, mankind, all people. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Salvation is available not to just a few, but to all. God so loved the world, John 3, verse 16. Jesus tasted of death for every man, Hebrews 2, verse 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, Titus 2, verse 11. Now, if that's God's primary desire for mankind, and it is, then that's why we should pray that civil rulers make it easier for that to happen. Now, in verses 5 and 6, Paul expands on this truth from verse 4 that God wants everybody to come to know and recognize. That word, come to a knowledge of the truth, end of verse 4, that word knowledge means recognition. Right? He wants them to come to, he wants everybody to come to a place in their lives where they recognize the truth. What truth? Well, specifically and in general terms, that's verses 5 and 6. That there's one God, that there's one mediator between God and men, and that is the one who is also man, Christ Jesus. And that Christ Jesus, verse 6, gave himself as a ransom for all. all right? So there's the, there are the basic fundamental truths that God wants for everybody to come to understand and recognize and admit. All right? Let's pull those apart. Yes? Is Christ a mediator for all, for all time, or is he just under the new covenant? We'll get to mediator momentarily. That's a good question. We'll get right there. All right. <clears throat> First of all, remember, there is one God, and that, remember, is a God for everybody. Right? Same God for all mankind, and so God wants the salvation the same salvation for everybody. And there is this one mediator. Let's talk about mediator. The word mediator is defined as one who causes or helps parties to come to an agreement. Right? Implied in that is that there are two parties who are at a disagreement. Okay, there are two parties that are at odds with each other. And those two parties need to come together. And so they need mediation. Right? That's a legal term that, uh, that, that's used not only in, in courts but in, in business arrangements. You know, Sometimes you have to have mediation to, to try to bring together a disgruntled employee with, with the, you know, the, uh, the heads of, of the department or whatever. So mediation. It's bringing two people out of harmony with each other, into harmony with each other. That's a mediator. Jesus is that mediator for us under this new covenant. Now, prior to the coming of Christ, the world generally, and even the Jewish people specifically, we're in a system that was imperfect, right? We just finished, right? You were here for most of our Hebrews study, right? We, we just went through Hebrews over the past uh, few months before we started this study. And that was one of the major things about the, the, the book of Hebrews was what it had to say about that old covenant system that had its form of mediation, okay? But it went through... 
priests who were of the Levitical line, okay, of the tribe of Levi, and they, they mediated between people, the high priest mediated between people and God through the use of animal sacrifice and all of that. And the whole point in Hebrews was, while that was important, served its purpose, it was never the purpose of that system and that form of mediation to be permanent. That God had destined for that to eventually come to an end when the perfect mediator would come. And that, of course, would be Jesus. So Jesus was not and could not operate as a high priest who was their primary mediator under that system. He could not operate as a mediator while that system, while that law was still in effect. Right? That's Hebrews 7, verse 12. The priesthood had been changed, and with the change in priesthood came also a necessity in the change of the law. Because it's evident that our Lord came out of Judah, concerning which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. Hebrews 7, 12 through 14. So Jesus was not mediator and go-between under that old system. It wasn't until He came in the form of flesh. He came as one of us. And we'll get to that point in just a moment where He refers to Jesus as man. But Jesus came as one of us, and because of that, because He shares our nature, He's now in the perfect position to be able to represent us before God. And here's the, here's the, the kicker with regard to the mediatorial role of Christ in bringing us and God together. A mediator needs to be someone who can represent both sides, right? Okay, mediator is one who is trying to represent both sides of the disagreement in a way that brings the disagreeable people to agreement. Jesus, being who He is, is the only one who is in the perfect position to be able to do that with us and God. And the reason is that He shares both our natures. They would call him Emmanuel, Matthew 1, which being interpreted means God with us. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. Jesus possesses the nature of deity. He also possesses the nature of humanity. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14. In that the children, that's us, have partaken of flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Jesus can represent us because He's one of us. He can represent God because He is God. You can't have somebody in a better position to mediate between two parties at odds with each other because of sin than Jesus, who's one of us and also God. And being in that position, Hebrews 7.25 says, He ever lives to make intercession for us. And He is the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews 8.6. And Hebrews 9, verse 15. And incidentally, his mediatorial role, his role as a mediator, is more than just him being an intercessor in our, in our prayers. But his being a mediator also involves this idea of the covenant. He is a mediator of the covenant, the new covenant, that involves him acting as our high priest in presenting his own blood the sacrificial blood, presenting that, figuratively speaking, before God to atone for our sins, which is something that needs to happen pretty regularly, doesn't it? Not His death, right? That He did once for all, Hebrews 9. But as He mediates for us and intercedes for us, it involves applying the benefits of that one-time sacrifice to our spiritual accounts when we need it. 
which is pretty regularly, right? 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Son cleanses, keeps cleansing us from all sin. So as we live life and commit sin from time to time, we need his blood applied to our accounts. Well, how does that happen? He does it. What is that? That's mediation. That's, that's healing the rift between us and God that happens because of our sin. It happened in that one-time act on the cross, His death and then His resurrection three days later, but the application of that happens regularly as we need it, as we live life from day to day. So that's also a part of His being mediator for us. It involves the application of the sacrificial blood of the covenant that He poured out for us a long time ago. And so it's because of His mediatorial role in offering Himself for our sins that thus bridges the gap between us and God that our sins created. It's because of all of that that we are able to approach God directly and with confidence and boldness. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find grace and mercy to help in every time of need. All right? Now, we're about out of time today, so I'm going to save this part for next week, Lord willing. And that is to look at Jesus as man. All right? In our text, he says, verse 5, 1 Timothy 2, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Okay? Now, just one side point very quickly. We can pray for each other, right? And be involved in intercessory prayer on each other's behalf, right? Okay. But as far as there being a mediator between us and God, they're just one of those, right? So just because I may pray for you, that doesn't put me on the same scale as Jesus, okay? Because that's still between individuals. Between us and God, Jesus is that mediator. Okay? And he's described as, in verse 5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We'll talk next week about the incarnation of Jesus, him becoming man, and the implications of that for us. And the fact that Paul here refers to Jesus as man at the time he's writing to Timothy. Jesus did not cease to be man when He ascended back to heaven after His resurrection. He did not cease to have that identification with us. All right, And this is one passage that tells us that. We'll look at some others that make that same point. And it is an absolutely thrilling thing to contemplate what Jesus did for us in becoming one of us. We'll talk about that next week. Thank you much.